Hey, this is Eastback author Jeff Young, and today I'm going to read you something a little bit different. Uh, today we're going to choose something from the Society for the Preservation of C.J. Henderson, which was in the uh, benefit anthology that I was asked to be part of. And this is one of the reasons, and some of the reasons that I got involved. Uh, the seed from my story, Finder, uh, came from a short story that I never finished called Knocking Down Walls, about a character who found unusual and strange supernatural items. Uh, the main character, Tony, was someone who started out normal and was changed so that his view of the world had to broaden enough to, ex to accept the inexplicable. And I won't say that C.J. Henderson, the things that are not there, and Teddy London's own revelation about the nature of the strange directly influenced me, but I certainly felt that there was a definite parallel between the two characters. So when I was asked to write a story for the anthology, Tony Reed was definitely the right choice. Uh, I decided Tony would keep stumbling over the efforts of people uh, to raise awareness of CJ's need for monetary help to offset his uh, growing medical bills. And I even went so far as to borrow two of his characters uh, from the Defending the Future anthology series, Rocky and Noodles, for a cameo. Uh, when I started this story, I knew I wanted a big finish, and one of the selling points for the pitch was that Tony was going to fight his final battle on a parade that was being held for CJ. And I really hope that he would have been amused by this notion. If anybody deserved a parade, which would, of course, include the dancing monkeys, it was CJ. Uh, so I'll put the cover for the book up here shortly, and then I'll read you uh, part of the story, and then I'll even give you a little bit of something that was never published before. So I should mention before I get started that the background that you're seeing behind me is actually the cover, part of the cover from the Society for the Preservation of C.J. Henderson. Uh, this story is a little bit unusual because it's done in the first person, and this is Finder. Just pay me. Simple, straightforward payment always works perfectly. And when the subject of favors given or owed comes up, life just becomes complicated, especially when the party owed is dead. My knees were up against the back of the seat in front of me, partially covering a sticker with the name C.J. Henderson on it. I was attempting to level out the surface of my tablet so I could type as Spindle drove the cat. Reed, yo, Reed, you listening? Spindle shouted over the music. I'm spinning at Hell No Kitty tonight. You should check it out. Trisha says you're usually there anyway. I've got some sick tracks this time. He drove like he DJed. Way more fingertips on the wheel instead of the traditional two and ten hold. And sometimes it felt like he was breaking in time to the dubstep blaring over the speakers. I'll probably be there. Keep all the wheels on the damn pavement. I went to the bar for totally different reasons, although Trisha's being there was certainly a bonus. I tried once again to consider Abramowitz's email, but couldn't. One of my friends was dead, his current girlfriend missing, and the whole debacle couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. No, really, he was the nicest guy I knew. And that meant the level of cutthroats, liars, and people who shouldn't be trusted with anything more dangerous than a spork in my circle of friends had just risen exponentially. Now wasn't the time to take on another client, but I couldn't ignore the email either. I wanted to have a look at Prester's place before I started thinking about anything else. So I drew my fingers together on the surface of the tablet and the email folded up and slid off to the side. I tucked the tablet back into my pants cargo pocket. I caught a brief flash of my reflection. My blonde stubble was one step away from being bald. Come on, I thought, time to focus. Instead, I looked out the window at the passing city blocks and tried not to think too hard about Prester. I was going to Prester to see what I could find. That's what I do, or mostly what people pay me for, finding objects and answers. I had a knack. It wasn't something I was born with. Amusingly enough, it found me. I'd done a favor for an unknown entity high enough up in the food chain of either the camp of ethereal goodness or downright demonic naughtiness. And as a favor, they changed my nature, giving me this little gift. Then, just to be truly ironic, this unknown benefactor took away my memory of what I did to put them in my debt, making the knowledge the one thing I can't find. Everything else just seems to come to me unbidden. An uncle's hidden bank account, in the Caymans, a child given up for adoption, or maybe something even a little bit more obscure like Babe Ruth's favorite bat. That's where my talent really lay, finding the unusual. After all, some of these items were hard to find for very, very good reasons. It took a while to realize it, but this talent of mine could actually pay my way in the world. Sometimes it took a great deal of work and risk. 
That would be why I am not so fond of favors. On the other hand, I owed Prester. More than once, Simon Prester had been there when I was down and out before I acquired my talent. He'd ask only one thing in return. If I shuffle up this mortal coil, just check in on what was important to me. I hate to leave things unfinished. So I was heading over to his self-made farm to follow through on that promise. The incident report I'd recepted from the, intercepted from the local PD said that his skull was fractured in several places, but it was the broken neck that killed him. Forensics determined he'd been thrown against the wall, evidenced by the star pattern of broken plaster at the point of impact and the pieces found in his hair. The boot that had kicked him in the head, snapping his neck while he lay on the floor, left a partial bloody footprint before its owner wiped it off the area rug. Spindle fishtailed the cab to a showy stop, throwing cinders and gravel into the air, generating small dust devils. I opened the door and shoved a debit card through the window at him. He slid it quickly before launching it back over his shoulder at me. We've played this game plenty of times before, so I caught it and stood it without even looking. I ducked as more gravel flew up as Spindle drove off. In front of me was a patch of vegetables and small fruit trees that could have looked more at home miles beyond the outskirts of the city. I walked the paths between the garden beds framed in cinder blocks toward the small split-level rancher. The back of the property sloped down in terraces towards the immense warehouse that loomed over the farm, placing the front door on the second floor. In China, these houses were known as nail homes. The owner was so stubborn that roads, apartment complexes, and factories were simply built around them and instead of demolishing the property. Prester's father had not been that stubborn, but his, had not only been that stubborn, but his son had inherited not only the property, but also the trait. Ordinarily, there would have been people about, but I had a feeling that the yellow police tape across the doorway put them off. I didn't let it stop me. Lifting it up, I walked in like I owned the place. His house hadn't been ransacked, so the police weren't leaning towards a robbery. I knew Prester well enough to believe he had nothing worth stealing. In fact, he was more likely to give the things away, including the produce of his farm. He'd reclaimed the land from the grounds of the failed businesses in the abandoned section of the city. And when the government turned off the electricity, Prester set up his own windmill and water wheel. And when others joined him, he showed him how to set up their own plots. And when the farm family began generating enough produce, he'd bought solar panels to hang on the roofs of the abandoned warehouses. He gave up the grid in the middle of the grid. But someone had ended all of that, and I was going to find out who. I wasn't going to forget my promise. I also knew I'd have to find Prester's girl or Ione. Finding people was always harder. They tended to up and move when you least expected it. I was at a loss for the motive of Prester's death. I stood there staring at the starred pattern on the wall of the living room. Someone big had thrown him against the wall. He'd flown over an end table and struck the wall, falling to the left, leaving the table standing. Smaller drops of blood rayed out from the center of the impact. And that was when I noticed the blood pattern that stood out from the others. It was like a streak from a brush stroke, which grew thinner at its terminal point downward. That was when my talent kicked in. I was already crouching down and looking at the underside of the table. My eyes caught the one tiny spot of blood on the carpet that was easy to disregard as a fallen drop. My fingers slid along underneath until they found something. It was an earring. And that's how my talent works. I find myself doing what it takes to find my target without any thought of my own. The diamond in the earring winked at me. I didn't know a whole lot about jewelry, but it struck me that the setting was pretty unusual. There were markings etched into the metal that were just visible around the stone. I could see how the police might have missed it in their search. The earring had shot off of Prester's head on impact. It slid down the wall, bouncing off the floor, coming to rest here to the underside of the table. And I thought about Prester and remembered he'd always worn a golden hoop. This was new. I felt a sudden twitch between my shoulder blades. I found what I was looking for. But what did it mean? Perhaps a visit to Abramowitz would be in order. After all, he was a jeweler and I was putting off dealing with his email. But before that, I took a look around the rest of the house. There was a small kitchen, two bedrooms, a bath, a living room, and a deck out the back just visible through a pair of French doors. I started with Prester's desk in the larger of the two bedrooms. There was a stack of flyers for a benefit on the left-hand side. Picking one up, I glanced at it briefly. Save C.J. Henderson was printed on large letters in the top. There were about 20 of them. I thought the name sounded familiar, and then I realized I recalled reading one of his Teddy London books. The sound of the front door opening echoed through the house, and I froze. 
footsteps. I threw down the papers and rushed toward the rear of the house. I slid open the French doors in the back and ducked under the rail of the deck over the side. I grabbed a hold of the edge behind a large planter and swung kicking in the air above the concrete slab of the carport below. I hung there for several minutes as the other visitor came outside. Heavy footsteps went back and forth before finally going into the house. A loud bang and the sound of smashing glass came through the open French door. Now that the crime scene work was done, apparently Prester's unwelcome visitor felt no need to be subtle. As the noise continued, I dropped down to the ground next to Prester's truck. It didn't take me long to find the keys. I got it started and I drove away as fast as I could, looking over my shoulder repeatedly. I hoped whoever was tossing Prester's house was making enough noise he hadn't heard the truck. If I was really lucky, I wouldn't have to explain to the police why I borrowed it. I drove through the alleyways that ran between the abandoned factories fast enough that their brick walls became a blur. I looped back around and then parked the truck out of sight of the house. Slowly, I worked my way through the gardens until I could see the front yard. I needed to be able to see just who was tearing up Prester's home. Pulling out my little GoPro camera out of my jacket, I set it up so it viewed the house. Hiding behind a large terracotta planter, I sanded my tablet out of my cargo pocket, synced with the camera, and zoomed in on the house. There was a large black SUV in the front. I adjusted the focus until I could see the license plate and snapped a picture. A moment later, the driver came out. From his size, I was fairly certain I was not only looking at who ransacked Prester's house, but possibly even his attacker. I snapped as many shots as I could, saving them in a file marked Musclehead. He was tall broad shoulders with olive skin and thick, heavy black brows. Black gloves covered his hands. And when he turned, I thought I saw something on his neck. And after a bit of zooming in, I found a small tattoo by his left ear. Aleph, I recognized, looking at the image again, recognizing the Arabic letter. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the earring. There was a curling mark at the edge of the setting. It definitely could be Arabic. It was, defi- it was certainly past time to go visit Abramowitz. I sent the jeweler an email to let him know I was stopping by. I also attached several pictures of the earrings to the message. After driving and parking Prester's truck several blocks away from the jeweler's brownstone, I sat in the vehicle for several moments to do some work on the tablet. I sent the pictures via an anonymous server to the police station for identification. The bot resident in their system would send the images my way when the task was done. Yes, it was good to have hacker friends sometimes. Sliding the tablet back into my pocket, I started down the alleyway. After letting the bronze door knocker drop, I shoved my hands into my jacket. March in the city was still cold, and the wind howled through the building, scudding the clouds along overhead, making them long, thin, and wispy. Air had a burnt scent to it, and when David Abramowitz opened the door, I was glad to step inside. His gray hair exploded from his head and chin almost like a collar, framing yellow glasses that were large enough to be goggles. Shoulders slumped, he turned to lead me down the long hallway away from the foyer, and down a series of steps to his workshop. Various rings and other pieces of jewelry were scattered about on a low table. He picked them up, carefully transferring them to nearby shelves so that we would have room to use the surface. David gestured towards a wooden chair upholstered in red leather and then sat across from me. Before saying anything, he pulled out a letter and a torn envelope and passed them over. It's my son, he said, as I quickly scanned over the note. Is any way at college, I asked, continuing to read? Well, that's it. Someone is threatening to give certain evidence to the security department at school implicating him in drug trafficking. Isaac isn't perfect, but he would never do anything like that. They're blackmailing me. I want you to find out who would do something like this. I looked over the paper once I'd read it through, turning it over in my hands. It was heavier than the usual grade, and when I held it up to the light, I was surprised to find a familiar Arabic letter war- marked in the low corner. Do you recognize this, I said to Abramowitz, including indicating the Aleph? His sharp intake of breath was all the response I needed. He looked away. Come on, David, you need my help. Now I need yours. What does it mean? It's nothing good, he reported sharply and looked me hard in the eye. Now let me see that diamond you talked to me about. Not sure about the sudden shift in focus, I handed over Prester's earring. David grunted once and reached behind him for a jeweler's loop. Peering at the diamond in its setting, he pursed his lips and sucked on his teeth. He pulled out a pair of needle-nose pliers and gently bent up all of the tines holding the diamond in the setting. And then with a sharp intake of breath, he quickly bent down two of the tines once again. Leave this with me, David said, pulling the loop from his eye. You know I can't do that. Any more than I can forget what you told me about Isaac, I replied, reaching for the diamond. 
David closed his hand, and for a brief moment, we struggled over the stone. If I give this to them, they, they just might let him go without doing anything, David coughed out, his breath coming in hoarse gasps. Instead of trying to pry his fingers apart, I closed mine around his. They, who, David? He wouldn't meet my gaze, and we stood there for a moment until a sudden gust of wind struck the house. And then he dropped the diamond and turned away from me. And as I bent to pick it up, David answered, they're the sons of Aleph, a splinter group of the Hezbollah, still intent on causing unrest in the Middle East, still intent on causing trouble even here. When I stood up with the diamond in my hand, David swung back around and pointed at the earring. And that is why they wanted to want me to do. Did you see the setting on the earring? It's engraved with the sacred text to bind the diamond in place. I've only heard of one other such instance where it was done. And my grandfather was given the tear of El Halaraz to cut into smaller stones. He was paid handsomely to set each stone with the words of binding. And then each stone was scattered around the world where they would never be joined together. The sons of Aleph want me to unset the stones that they have because they know that only one of my family can undo what my father bound. Looking down at the earring, I thought about what he said. It was possible that there might be a buyer interested in the historic value of the pieces of the tier of El Haraz, El Aharaz, who might pay handsomely and therefore fund the sons of Aleph. Just as possible was the unfortunate fact that the diamond initially had some otherworldly power that the sons of Aleph were seeking. It also made sense that the sons were the ones responsible for Prester's death. I closed my finger around the earring, fingers around the earring. It didn't matter where they hid. I was going to find them and then drag them, kicking and screaming into the cold light of day. Here's what you'll do, David. You'll tell them that you know, you'll do what they ask you to, and that you know who has another one of the diamonds. You can give them this number. I pulled him out a business card and handed it to him. Hopefully I can make sure that the police or Homeland Security find them first but you'll be doing enough that Isaac should be off the hook one way or another. Reed, I don't know what to say. I just can't let anything happen to Isaac. He's all I have since his mother passed away. David, I understand. But more importantly, do you? We'll work this out. Just do your part, and now I'd best be going. Standing in the doorway, I looked back at David, who seemed even older and more shrunken than before. And when I turned away and stepped out into the street, I used my talent to find out who was watching me, but it turned out that the only one that was interested was a squirrel hanging on the side of a tree half a block away. That would be good enough for now. I made my way back to Prester's truck and then on to the Hell No Kitty bar. When I walked in, Trisha slid a 16-year-old single malt across the bar until it came to rest two inches from the end. I wondered briefly how long she'd practiced that trick as I walked up to her. She wiped her hands off on the plaid towel and then reached out, put both of them on either side of my face, and pulled me in to kiss me on the cheek. Her long, thick blonde hair was gathered into, thick, into big braids that cascaded down her neck, rustling as she moved. Hey, Ice Maiden, I said. She threw me a knowing smile and cocked her hip to one side. Did you find my keys yet? I pointed to the drink shaker at the end of the bar and raised an eyebrow. We always play this game. She swayed over to pick up her keys and gestured toward the first booth. It was early and the bar only had a few patrons. She knew I liked to sit and watch the crowd other than drink and talk. I slid across the wooden bench and leaned against the back wall, letting the murmur of the bar drift over me. Most people need a quiet place to think. Me, I'm the opposite. I find patterns in odd places. So I need something like a background hum, a susurrus, a tintinabulation, or in this case, a half heard conversations to spark my talent. Anyone who watches shooting stars will tell you that you can see more when you relax your eyes and don't try to focus. In this case, I was looking for stray diamonds. And when a friend of mine found out that I had written a story called Finder, they told me that you really need to write three other stories because it's finders, keepers, losers, weepers. And that certainly makes sense. And since the other story was based off of another story, I started thinking a little bit more about that. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to come up with things that were in between those stories um, because there is finder, keeper, loser, and weeper for the four stories. And there were little bits that were gonna go in between. And this is a little bit called Squarewood. Squarewood, it made a sort of sense that Trisha knew someone there. The regularly shaped piece of woods a few miles out from the city limits was the leftover that it would stood urban sprawl. Trisha looked back at me and smiled, pulling a double duffel bag from the backseat of her SUV, 
And all that went straight out of my mind. In fact, out of my mind must be where I am right now since I'd given in whenever Tricia had asked me whether or not I wanted to learn how to shoot. I rubbed my eyes and looked up as she was grasping a bunch of glass bottles with ropes attached to them. She'd already laid two pistols and a box of ammunition on the seat of the car. As I watched her walk over to the large oak tree with its downward hanging branches, I thought about recent events and the gun that had been thrust at the back of my head. I'd always told myself, I don't need a gun. Watching Trisha tie the bottles to the branches, I laughed briefly. I should have known she'd know how to handle a gun, although I always suspected there was either a katana or cricket back under the, bat under the bar. There'd actually been a Glock. A few seconds later, she was snugged up behind me in a very distracting fashion, and we were ten yards away from the oak. Her arm ran along mine, fingers steadying my grip, and that bundle of blonde hairs of hers brushed my cheek. I heard a little bit of familiar litany. Make sure the safety is off, and take a breath. And that breath was full of her scent, and she smelled a lot like a mixture of cedar and sage. Let half out. Her stirred the short air, hair next to my ear and gently squeeze the trigger. Then I shot the tree. I'm thoroughly blaming Cedar and Sage. What did that tree ever do to you? Trisha asked with a chuckle. I sighed. It looked at me funny, I swear. It was planning on falling on your car, I know it. She was openly laughing now, leaning against me at the same time gently forcing the ground to point toward the gr gun to point toward the ground. She looked down the field at the tree and the swaying targets. She tapped her finger on her bottom lip. We should move the car, shouldn't we? I had to agree. And later, I could hit most of the bottles despite their swinging. I was actually starting to feel good about things. And then Tricia stepped up to the line and shot every bottleneck free of the string. Did my best to shut my mouth as soon as I could, but I suspected it was hanging open for a while. And on the drive back, I was still thinking about her offer. I could borrow one of those guns if I wanted to. But did I really want to? A gun was a commitment. And maybe that wasn't one I was ready for yet. It made me think just a tiny bit about another commitment. If I couldn't handle a gun, I certainly couldn't handle her. Both, both would take time. All right. And that's today's reading for eSpec Books. And don't forget, right now is a great time to buy eSpec Books. eSpec Books, eBooks that is, are 99 cents. So you've got a great selection of science fiction, fantasy, steampunk, and even a little bit of everything else, maybe even horror, on this particular anthology. So thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Hang in there. We're all there with you. Cheers.